Chapter 13, Part 2, Northern Europe. I also have another heading for that. So this is Part 3 of Chapter 13. And as you know, we're going to Northern Europe and see what was going on up there. And this section um, will be divided into two parts as well. So let's start off in France. So high Renaissance art in France. The artist Jean Clouet found favor at the royal court. His flattering portrait of Francis I portrayed the king's distinctive features and highlighted the nervous activity of his fingers. Uh, this is another one of those paintings where I like to point out problems. Um, but just look at the man's neck and maybe the way that the drapery is handled over here on the sleeve, for example. So um, I'm sure it was the best he could do. But let's keep moving. So here's a, a little hunting lodge that Francis I had transformed into his palace, his palace outside of Paris, a palace where he could conduct the affairs of state but not be in the city. And there's a lot more leisure grounds out in the palaces. So this is Fontainebleau. This is an aerial view of it. It's a bonus feature. Um, the text includes an interior of Fontainebleau, but I wanted you to see the whole thing. So um, there's the palace. And this is um, an example of how the interior was decorated. So Francis I hired Francesco Primaticcio to finish the painting project at Fontainebleau. The chambers of the king's mistress were richly and densely decorated with wall paintings and stucco figures. So Primaticcio was a, a mannerist painter in Italy. Um, Italy is really where mannerism was. And uh, it has an audience in France. So the king liked it and brought an artist up to do his decorations. So this is just an example. It's, um, it supposedly reflects his taste. Right. Let's look at some more mainstream stuff, the stuff that would have been seen by a slightly wider audience. So this is in Germany now. Uh, Matthias Grunewald's style continued indigenous currents of emotional medieval spirituality. I didn't show you that, but there's plenty of it. Um, images of horror and pain, especially of the crucifixion and death of Christ, um, just get a lot of attention in the Gothic period. When the altarpiece was open, this altarpiece, um, paintings of St. Anthony were displayed on the wings. So there are three states of this altarpiece, and these this is the third and final state with, where it's the most open. And the interior here, this niche, has some actual wood carvings by an artist named Hagenauer. And um, the, the altarpiece is really focused on St. Anthony, St. Anthony of the Desert, the same Anthony we saw earlier who was tortured by the demons in that early print. Um, and we're going to look here. I've also included a link to a film that I like to show to my students because it is kind of confusing to understand how this whole altarpiece works and fits together. Um, this is the first state where it is the most closed up, although I really think that these side panels probably fold in too. So it's, it's a pretty dynamic, um, altarpiece as such. It was placed in a hospital for patients who had extreme skin diseases. <clears throat> um, and it was, oh, the, it was uh, dedicated, the hospital was dedicated to St. Anthony, so it was the hospital of St. Anthony. Um, it features the work of two artists, like we've seen, Matthias Gunnarwald and Hagenauer. It reflects the Catholic beliefs and is focused on the saints that were believed to heal skin diseases, including plague. Um, so Grunewald painted the many panels in three different states, and this is the first state. He painted them in 1511. So this is close, where you have um, St. Sebastian on the left, the crucifixion in the center, and St. Anthony on the right. 
So Sebastian was a saint who had been shot many times by arrows by people wishing to kill him. He did not die that way, um, but still, because of his many arrow wounds, he's often shown with arrows sticking out of his body and wounds on his body. So that brings him into the realm of skin diseases and recovering from them. <clears throat> this is the crucifixion of that state and the, the center panel of that. So he portrayed the tortured body of Jesus in horrific detail with grieving figures in anguish around the cross. And I really, I really encourage you to watch the film because it will give you a lot of good details of this where the skin is just uh, disgusting and there are thorns popping out and there's blood and scabs and his feet look absolutely wretched. So it reflects a lot of skin and um, physical issues that would have been a source of pain. And that's because the people in the hospital were suffering. And this uh, comforted them in a way to say, you're suffering and Jesus suffered also. And uh, you will have an end to your suffering, which of course they all do. This is an imaginary crucifixion scene. And I think it's very poorly painted. Um, Mary Magdalene, for example, seems to be shown much too small, almost child size here. Uh, Mary and John, comfort John is comforting Mary. Over here is John the Baptist uh, with the lamb that is one of his attributes, the lamb of God. And anybody who's familiar with the, any of the gospel books knows that by the time Jesus was crucified, John the Baptist was long dead. So he could not have been there. So it's really an imaginary scene. And John's forefinger is extremely long. So this is not great painting, uh, but there's a lot of craft involved still. This is the second state on the inside um, open before you get all the way to the end. So in this state, uh, the meetings of St. Anthony and Paul, well, that's not what I'm seeing here. Hmm. Oh, that's on the, the left. This is, sorry, open one. Sorry, sorry. Um, which includes the Annunciation on the left panel. And in the center, we've got an angel concert where there are angels entertaining the virgin and child. So this is really one scene, and it's, it, it's a little bit misleading because of this dark line separating them. But there are angels playing musical instruments over here and uh, Virgin Mary holding baby Jesus being entertained on this side. And now on the right, we have the, the resurrection of Jesus where he has this, uh, this huge, brilliant halo that is almost like a rainbow illuminating almost his entire body. And he floats up out of the tomb while his guards are sleeping down here. And you can see by looking at his body here that he has recovered from all those wounds that were shown in the crucifixion. So again, please watch the video. It's not terribly long, um, but I think it has a lot of good details and uh, will astound you. So this is Matthias Grunewald and the Isenheim altarpiece. Then our next artist is considerably different. We're going to look at several works of uh, Durer. So this is Albrecht Durer, and his style of intense observation rendered his works with lifelike representations, linear perspective, and a new canon of proportions. His self-portrait represents the artist as idealized, as it emphasizes his artistic and intellectual talent. So we're going to pause for a moment on this while I tell you more about Durer. He became an international celebrity. He traveled widely around Europe. He knew many well-known figures, including Erasmus of Rotterdam, who, who was a reformer of the church, and Bellini, um, a painter in Venice. He ran the business of being a professional artist, and he used an agent to help sell his prints. His wife and mother also helped in the business. Durer even filed a lawsuit against an Italian artist for copying one of his uh, compositions. Like Leonardo, Durer wrote many treatises on a variety of topics, but unlike Leonardo, he finished them and he published them. 
He wrote that Grunewald's art, the man we just saw with that uh, altarpiece, Grunewald's art was like a wild, unpruned tree because it lacked a theoretical foundation. I think you can understand. I showed you some of the issues with Grunewald's painting. Um, and Durer also left a record of himself in a series of self-portraits, a journal, and a lot of correspondence. He made two trips to Italy, and we're going to see the results of some of his trips. So this is his self-portrait. And here's a group of his self-portraits. I put the numbers beside them to show you the age he was at the time these were made. Uh, the 13-year-old one is extremely precocious. I mean, I cannot imagine any 13-year-old I've ever known being able to draw like that. And here's, um, here's the curious thing about this. If you've ever tried to draw a picture of yourself, you know you have to gaze at yourself in a mirror, and therefore the image you see of yourself has the eyes looking straight at you. But Durer showed himself with his eyes looking to the side. So that's um, extremely precocious. And here he is as a, a dashing young man. You can see he's very interested in fashion, especially um, at age 26, his fashion <laughs> sort of takes over, dominates the composition. And then we have his very mature, only 28 down there, the one I just showed you. So he did many prints. Because now we have uh, advanced printmaking techniques I showed you in early Renaissance art and um, paper. So he did this woodcut. I'm going to show you several. There's a lot of bonus features here, but I wanted you to get a good idea of the genius of Albrecht Durer. He's really the best example we have of a Renaissance man and a true intellectual in Northern Europe at this time. So this is uh, called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. It's a woodcut. I think it represents his early um, early style. And it, to me, it's, it's a little bit chaotic. It's a little bit confusing uh, because there's so many figures. It's difficult to determine where there's a focal point and even what's going on. You can, if you spend time with it, you can pick them out. Um, you can see the horses here and trampling over the people in the, the ground here and an angel up above. This is uh, Durer's signature This at the bottom, this little uh, large capital A with a D inside of it. His name again is Albrecht Durer, so it's an A and a D. And this is slightly later. This is an engraving, so it's a different medium, and it's after he has been to Italy and he has seen the work that was being done down there, including the revival of classical nudes. I've shown you several examples of those. So he sketched and he takes ideas from Italy, brings them back, and puts them in this print, among others. So this engraving of Adam and Eve shows the figures in ideal human proportions. The four humors of human physiology are depicted within a descriptive northern style landscape. So this was, again, medical science at the time believed that there were four humors or uh, substances that flowed in the body. And if they got out of balance, uh, you would get sick. And depending on what your sickness was, it showed which humor was dominating. So there's a, and he's depicting those in these little animals that are stuck around the picture, including a choleric cat, the melancholic elk, elk, this is the elk, uh, the sanguine rabbit, and the phlegmatic ox. The choleric cat, here's the ox, the choleric cat is in the foreground, and Adam has trapped a mouse under his foot. So the cat and mouse symbolize the tension of this moment in human history. So in the creation story, this is when are the exact moment when everything begins to fall apart, when Adam and Eve rebel against God. And you can see um, there's a serpent in the tree, which is eating on an apple, and it looks like Eve has another one in her left hand. So things are about to, to collapse. Um, but 
Now, in terms of the art, you can see how their forms uh, do get prominence, that they have been isolated against this dark background where he's been able to use a lot of lines um, on his plate to make it darker so that their bodies pop out. So we don't have that same issue as the Four Horsemen. And here's another bonus feature. I like this one. Uh, these prints, again, would have been mass-produced and sold by his family business. And uh, ordinary people like you and I would purchase a print and put it up on the wall of our humble little homes um, and to remind us of God and our own role in um, our life story. So Night, Death, and the Devil is just such a print where the human individual is personified as the knight or the, uh, symbolized as this knight who's on his journey through life. And he's besieged by death. Death is right beside him uh, with an hourglass reminding him that his days are numbered, his minutes, his hours are numbered. And the devil hounding him from behind, looking very scary with this single horn. Um, he has a faithful companion in his dog that is joining him on his journey. This is his goal. It's shown as a castle on a hillside, but that is symbolizing heaven, of course, that each individual must uh, gird yourself, protect yourself with the armor, and journey through life, hoping to get to heaven in the end. And another Durer, this one is very popular because it, it um, appeals to the emo elements of um, young people for some reason. <laughs> so it's called Melancholia, and there's a bat flying in the sky holding up the word Melancholia, and it's an angel who seems to be in the dumps, sitting there kind of depressed, surrounded by odd objects that seem to have some significance, some meaning, a ladder a number board, an hourglass, a bell, you know, it just, um, it just cries for interpretation. So this is Durer Melancholia. And two of my favorites. Um, it's nice to see Durer doing some color work. So this shows his keen observation of nature, which is very much like the, the northern artists who came before him, like Jan van Eyck. Uh, just looking sharply, looking closely, and uh, feeling compelled to represent every detail. This is obviously a rabbit, and this is called a clump of turf. It's one of my favorites. I think those are dandelions, but it's still, it's just so beautiful. The observation and the execution are just exquisite. So I told you he kept journals, and he was inquisitive, and he wrote and published. So here on the left are two of his prints where he was demonstrating how an artist could overcome difficulties with uh, this extreme foreshortening, like Montaigne had issues with the dead Christ. So he uses a, like a window with a grid in it, and then he gridded his paper so if you've ever used grids to copy things, it's just like that, only he's copying from real life. So he would gaze through his window and fill each grid in his paper with what he saw through his window grid. And then he would overcome his, um, his tendency to try to make this look like a real human. He would just treat it like shapes and forms and spaces. And another one down here where he's doing the same thing with a musical instrument. So I think that's, um, that's fun and interesting to see his sketches. Now we're going to talk about the Protestant Reformation because it, was, uh, it happened in, in the north of Europe. It started there. It started quietly. Catholic priests and important early reformers Desiderius, Erasmus, and Martin Luther began to question the Pope's supremacy and several of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. They said, where are you getting this stuff? So the Augustinian friar Martin Luther wrote out 95 theses, that means uh, arguments, to bring to the attention of the church leaders. He also posted them in German on the church door. It was like a community bulletin board of the university town of Wittenberg, Germany, on October 31st, 1517. They were quickly printed and circulated throughout Europe. 
The lack of response from the church or a willingness to consider change led them to break away in a reformation. So that's kind of what started the whole thing. The picture on the right is from a film called Luther. It's not terribly old, and it was starring Joseph Fiennes as Martin Luther, um, posting up his big list of arguments uh, on the church door. And you can see he's not the first person to post something there. The movie also shows how as soon as he posted them, a printer in Wittenberg took them down, took them into the print shop, committed them to uh, type and printed multiple copies of them, sending them all over Germany. So um, they got a lot of uh, press there. These are the doors of Wittenberg today on that very church, and those 95 theses have been cast in bronze on the church doors. So what was, what was he saying there? What was Martin Luther's argument? Well, um, I'd like to reduce them to two big ideas, and these are really, really big ideas. Uh, and Martin Luther called them sola fide, which is Latin for only by faith. So by faith alone are people saved and welcomed into the kingdom of God. In other words, the church cannot save people and we cannot purchase or earn our salvation in any way. It's no good to pay indulgences. It's no good to go on a pilgrimage because that's not going to get you into heaven. You can only get there by believing. And sola scriptura is only the scripture or the Bible is the only reliable authority about God, Jesus, and the Christian life. In other words, the Pope is not the ultimate authority. So if the Pope says something and it cannot be supported by the Bible, then it is clearly not the Word of God. So um, 95 Theses, both sides refused to cave and they both demonized the other. The Protestant Church formed and Rome launched a counter-reformation. So this is going to shape the next few centuries in art. Protestants emphasize Jesus Christ, and they de-emphasize Mary and the saints. Fits of iconoclasm were destructive to some works of art. So fits of iconoclasm means that there were some followers of Martin Luther, not Martin Luther, who um, led revolts and they went into Catholic churches and destroyed artwork and sometimes burned the churches, but they would smash the statues of the saints and Virgin Mary, the very types of things that we've been looking at in this course. So on the left is a picture of a Roman Catholic church, um, a later church, I'll show it to you again, but it's got uh, all these paintings on the wall. It has a whole little island that is full of statuary here. There's statues all around it. And on the right is a Protestant church. So Protestant church is cleared out. They did not want to um, create a lot of imagery. They would mainly focus on a cross. And often it's an empty cross that signifies the resurrection instead of a crucifix which has a body on it. So here's, here's that map again showing you Europe with all of the areas of dissent and difference. So yellow, of course, being Roman Catholic, Spain, 100%. Uh, Italy pretty much. The little dots here are the people who are leaning towards Catholic, uh, uh, towards, sorry, towards Protestantism. And there, there's a lot of persecution going on everywhere when people are living next door to somebody who believes differently. Um, but this is, this is the Europe that goes into the future. It's going to be quite different. <clears throat> So here are two panels painted by Albrecht Durer of the four apostles. They may have been painted by Durer to commemorate the, or to demonstrate the possibility of Protestant imagery and art. The saints depicted in these two panels are John, this is left to right, John, Peter, Paul, and Mark. These were dedicated to the German city of Nuremberg, which had adopted Lutheranism. <clears throat> and the Protestant aspect of this, there's, there's a lot, but 
These people do not have halos, so they're shown as ordinary men. They are focusing on the words, so they're, they're all looking at a copy of the Bible. And we have here John, who is showing something to Peter. And you have to remember the Catholic Church was always claiming Peter as their poster boy, as their star champion, the reason they were Jesus's only chosen church. And we have John here showing Peter a thing or two. So that sort of um, puts Peter in a dependent position upon John. I'm just saying, it's, it's baby steps. It's very subtle. And now I hope you get that, um, the difference and what was going on in, in Europe in terms of the Protestant Reformation. So we're going to continue um, briefly after this with part four.